All right, Thank you. Well, we have we have uh, Dutch again tonight. For those of you that joined us last time, um, for a great, great, great uh, presentation that that is days long, and um, he split it up into three parts for us. Thank you, Dutch, for doing that. So this is part two. And for those of you that came in late, part three is going to be next week. And it uh, right now it's a different code. So look for, a di don't check back into this one next week. Um, and we'll finish up with part three. And uh, we're going to learn more about thread control. What were you talking about when we got on Dutch? Were you answering a, uh, a thread question or? Yeah, a question came up. Uh, Kathy mentioned she likes Vivas thread. And uh, Vivas has an interesting story in the way they approach their manufacturing, but it's a, a really, really strong thread. And I'd say I use it probably over 90% of the time, primarily because it's strong. But uh, when you go down the pathway of tying salmon flies, you, you get this attitude of uh, trying to make certain that your patterns, when you, when you dress a fly, that you minimize the amount of bulk and uh, using a very small diameter thread, but yet a, a small diameter thread that's very, very strong uh, has proven to be very valuable uh, in dressing salmon flies. And, and I just seem to uh, do the same. I use the same thread pretty much regardless of uh, the pattern I'm tying when I'm, when I'm spinning deer hair. A lot of times I will use GSP and things like that, although I have spun hair with Beavis simply because it's so strong. Uh, but it's, um, it's an excellent thread for sure. And I mentioned to some, if you didn't hear earlier, if, if you happen to go online and take a look at the evaluations and the, um, the, the occasions where people will gather different types of thread and test it for breaking, breaking strength and so forth. Uh, Vivas is always rated right in top. So it's a very, very strong thread, uh, but it's also, uh, so I like, uh, typically uh, the flies I tie, I'll tie in a 14 or 16 on. Um, no matter what type of pattern it is, I like a very small diameter, uh, mainly just to eliminate the bulk uh, in, in the fly pattern. So tonight uh, we're gonna focus on using thread control to hold and tighten material. We did discuss a few of these skills and techniques last time, but I wanted to emphasize more of it tonight. Uh, last, last session, we did talk about, uh, as a matter of fact, I should say this too, since our last session, I've taken all the skills and techniques and I've divided them into two categories. Uh, the first category is fundamental thread control skills and techniques. They're just important skills a fly tire should develop uh, regardless of the type of patterns they're, they're tying or, and that type of thing, but just good, good skills to have and good understanding. I want to emphasize that, a good understanding of how to control your thread to your benefit uh, to dress a, a fly properly. All of these topics here in red are things that we discussed last time. And these are all fundamental uh, skills. Uh, we'll have some additional skills that we did not get to last time that we can continue to talk about uh, next week if you'd like. But uh, tonight what I'd like to do is, is do some more in this second category instead of the, in addition to the that? fundamental skills and techniques the second category is using thread control to hold and tighten material. And I wanted to emphasize more things there because these are very practical things you can use uh, as you're, as you're uh, attaching and securing material uh, to the hook shank. We did discuss one through six last time and tonight uh, we're gonna jump right into mounting wings, uh, using loops to mount a wing or tail. And I'll tell you right now, I'll probably say it again when we get to it. This is one of my favorite thread control skills and techniques of all. I use this uh, almost exclusively uh, when I'm, when I'm uh, securing a tail or a wing, especially a feather wing. And we'll, we'll discuss that here shortly. Um, but in addition to those two topics, uh, we'll see how far we can get with, with all of these topics. These are all 
topics that pertain to using thread control to hold and tighten material. And I'll tell you one thing that you, you'll find maybe kind of interesting is uh, folding feathers is kind of a new thing to a lot of folks, but there's three, I'm gonna show you three different ways to do that. How to control your peacock curl as you're wrapping, and I'll show you two different ways to do that. But number 11 and 12, I think are pretty intriguing. Um, if Ann Miller was on, we could talk about caddis flies don't have tails, so we're not in caddis pattern, we don't need to use this, but stone flies, mayflies, other uh, insects that have tails, uh, th these two techniques are very, very valuable, and it's, they're, they're skills to develop to attach or secure two tails in a fly pattern or three tails in a fly pattern. Now, here's what's unique or interesting about this. In both of those skills and techniques, once you tie in the material, you don't touch it again with your hands. Your thread controls the the proper placement, the spacing of the, of the tail materials and so forth. But we'll, we'll see that here in just, just a little bit. So I, I think we mentioned this quickly last time, but it's so important I wanted to bring it up again. Also because we're gonna discuss mounting a feather wing uh, hair for a feather wing fly. And that is that soft hair, the, the, the basic understanding is that soft hair compresses very well, hard hair does not compress well at all. And when tying in hair as a wing or throat, the ability of particular hair to compress makes all the difference. Uh, for example, um, I'm gonna move that bar. For example, uh, you will hear tires say that they don't like to tie a, a, a hair wing pattern using squirrel because squirrel is too slippery. Uh, well, squirrel tail can, that material can be, but the slipperiness of that material is actually the second problem. The first problem is that squirrel material or squirrel hair is very, very, very hard. Now, here's how that looks. These, I, I rated these hairs, and this is just something I put together. I can't reference it for you to some other source, but if we start with soft hair, what is soft hair? and wood is hard hair. So if we're gonna tie a feather wing, or I mean a hair wing pattern, and we wanna make sure that we have material that will uh, be more compatible to tie as a, as a wing, we can start with soft hair like Arctic fox, deer body, bucktail. Now, interesting thing about bucktail, you'll notice I say it should be B-U-T-T, -T, bucktail, the butt ends, Interesting thing about bucktail is if you take a, 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 a hide of bucktail, taking hair from any one of three different locations on that bucktail will perform differently when you dress it on the fly. Uh, some bucktail, for example, at the lower part uh, compresses and it'll tend to, to uh, splay out more and spin and so forth. But it's just on one species, just on one bucktail, uh, you can you can compress the hair differently on just off of one tail, but if the point here is if she had a start, puppy. Pardon me. That um. I'm sorry, I'm not here to mute somebody. Dutch, sorry. Okay, okay. If we start with the concept that Arctic hair and these hairs here are softer, these hairs will compress better. That's the point right there. That when you're dressing a fly using hair for a hair wing fly, uh, sometimes you'll say, you'll, 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 take, you'll secure the wing using uh, fox or skunk or something like that, something in this part of the list. You say, well, that was pretty easy. But then you'll come down here sometime and maybe use squirrel, uh, bear, uh, calf tail, the bottom two thirds. And you'll think, well, that, why, why was, that, was that more difficult to tie in? But it has to do with the hardness or the softness of the hair and that the softer hair will compress better. So for example, if we took a clump of squirrel and we, we did a pinch wrap and tied in a clump of squirrel for a wing uh, and you can secure that as tightly as you can, 
you can still reach into the middle of that clump of squirrel and actually pull some hairs out. It's very frustrating. Uh, I'm going to show you some techniques here in just a little bit on how to secure elk hair and deer hair so it doesn't spin on you when you're fishing. But in any case, the point here is just understand that the softness or hardness of a hair uh, has to do with the compressibility of that particular type of hair. And the softer hair compresses better and it'll feel more compatible in using that to dress a wing uh, or a collar. Now, also I was gonna mention here, there's, um, you could use some alternative, uh, let me see if I can do this here. Hang, bear with me. Okay. I haven't found it yet. I've got a webcam set up here. We'll keep checking that. But if you wanted to, if you were using a hard hair and you wanted to try different methods to tie that hair in so it would be secure, especially for a fishing fly, uh, there's different methods you can use. A reverse method where instead of tying the, the clump of hair in in the traditional manner, you tie it in so that the, the ends of the hair go out over the eye, tie it in, and then bend the hair back into the regular wing position and secure that bend. Uh, another is a stack method that if you think of how thick or how much hair you would have in a, in a clump of hair to use for a wing, instead of tying in the whole clump at one time, take a half or a third and tie in sections at a time to secure it. It'll secure a little better than using the hole, especially if you're using squirrel and stuff like that. A staggered cut means that when you, when you prepare the material to attach it to the hook shank, instead of cutting the material straight across uh, the butt ends, you, you make a staggered cut and you actually layer the thread onto the staggered cut. We talked some about a return eye hook and how you can actually uh, slide a hair into, um, you can slide hair into um, the return portion of the eye uh, and that will, and then you can do a figure eight and then get the tie in, tie, hold the, the clump of hair down to create the angle you want security in that way. But that return portion of the eye really, really does a good job of keeping it in place. And if we, you didn't see it last time, uh, let me see if I can, uh, it's not gonna enlarge. But I'll hold this up here. This is what a return eye looks like. Uh, instead of just having a regular hook shank that goes down and forms the eye, the eye is actually formed by the hook shank and the, 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 it, the, the, sh the shank returns alongside of the initial hook shank. Uh, there's, that creates a little separation right in here and you can actually slide material in there. Uh, this, this is a very traditional, very uh, old kind of uh, concept in fly tying. And if you're tying a lot in hand, uh, you can, it, it really can help you to tie using a return eye hook and use the return to help secure material while you're dressing the fly. And by the way, speaking of, of hooks, uh, the hook you see there in the vise right now is a blind eye hook. And uh, a couple of things about this I wanted you to notice. Uh, many of you I know do a lot of teaching. And uh, one thing in particular here is if you're teaching and you, you, are wrapping thread uh, and maybe doing a demonstration of, a, of an actual thread pattern and you are dressing a fly, this can work just fine. But if you are doing something like this we're doing tonight, where you're actually talking about individual techniques, I, there's a feature of this. It's a blind eye. There's no eye on this hook. So if I turn it that way, you'll see there's no eye on there. And I use these for salmon flies because I'll, I'll actually tie gut on 
uh, silk gut to to form the eye of the hook. But what's That's nice about this for those for those of you that tie or teach, uh, you can demonstrate something like this on the on the hook. And when you're done, you just pull it off. It's Doc, a really um, quick and easy way to do that. I, I'm worried. Can everybody see in the you? It's a small screen off to the side of your slide. And uh, I would just want to make sure that everybody in the audience can see what you just demonstrated, or we may have to shut down the slide and show your camera screen. Patty, did you see that okay? You're muted. I did. Okay. I, I understood it. Yeah. Um, sometimes. Uh, Great concept. You, yeah. When you run your cursor over the box, sometimes a little thing shows up here where you can actually click okay. on it and enlarge. Good. Thank you, Dutch. I just wanted to make sure because it's a small box off to the side. Al, could you see it? Thumbs up. No, he couldn't see it. Kathy saw it. Barbara saw it. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh, Al saw it. Okay, good. 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 Sorry to interrupt, Dutch. I just want. It's I just okay. wanted to make sure because that was such a good point um, that people could see it. It really helps. I know a lot of you do teach and it really can uh, speed up the teaching and so forth, being able to get from one technique to the other. One other thing that I wanted to point out here that you'll notice uh, right here on the tip, the hook point, you'll see that little piece of plastic. And I, years ago I started, uh, I, I was actually, uh, I, I had a bad day and I actually found myself in the part of the store where they sell pierced earrings. And I happened to see these little plastic keepers right here that ladies will buy. And when you are not using a particular uh, pierced earring, you can slide this little keeper over the point on the, on the earring so you don't stick yourself. Well, when I saw that, I, I don't wear pierced earrings, but I have another use for that. So I bought a bunch of these things. And when I'm tying in general, not just for demonstration purposes, but when I'm tying in general, I always put one of these on the hook point while I'm tying. Now, if you're using salmon flies, big flies like this, uh, if you like to use uh, uh, gamagatsu or the sticks, those kinds of, those hooks are extremely sharp. And you can get very tired of sticking yourself all the time on that hook point. Uh, but if you just put one of those little things on there, it sure helps a lot to avoid uh, sticking yourself. Now let's get right into mounting a hair wing. And in this case, we're gonna hold the hair wing, or the, the, the hair material firmly on top of the hook shank where we wanna tie it in. And we're gonna measure the length of it to make sure that we've got the right length. This is also a time to look at it and make sure you've got the right size clump, that the diameter of your material is, 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 is in proportion to your particular pattern. But most of all, we're looking at the finding the ideal uh, tie-in spot. And that will be based a lot on where this material extends to the tip of the tail. Uh, and this particular pattern is the blue charm, uh, golden pheasant crest tail. And by the way, I found this kind of interesting. When I had my experience with uh, Michael Redensich, he, we were tying, we were dressing a salmon fly. And he said, uh, Dutch, what do you think is the most important element on a salmon fly? And uh, I didn't want to sound like an idiot. So I said, well, you know, I think the married wing or maybe nice a cheek or, uh, you know, I named several things and he kept shaking his head no. And in, in Michael's opinion, the tail on a fly, especially when you have something like golden pheasant crest, it not only attracts the eye, but it sets the proportion for the whole rest of the fly. Now, in this case, we're measuring a clump of hair to tie in as the wing. And to get the correct tie-in spot, this clump has to be long enough to come to the tip of that particular tail. Once I've got the right length on the material, I'll switch hands and go back to the tie-in spot and make sure it's right over the exact tie-in spot then I always prepare the material before I tie it in. I shouldn't say always. You're gonna see one example tonight of, of an occasion when I don't do that, but most of the time, I'd say 90% of the time, the material is prepared before we take it to the hook shank. So here I'm gonna clip those butt ends, and now I've got enough of the butt ends sticking out here 
my thread is hanging at the tie in spot. I'm going to hold the, the wing in place. Then I'm going to do uh, some, I'm going to do a pinch wrap, some tightening wraps over the wing butts right at the tie in spot. And I'm going to do edge to edge wraps to the eye and then return to the tie in spot. Now, this is one of those occasions where I will, in fact, allow a wrap to go over a preceding wrap when I'm trying to build the taper on a head. Uh, but it, just like we said, I think last time, just remember that putting multiple wraps of thread over top of the previous wraps does not strengthen the attachment or the security of the, of the material. I was delighted to see when you when you might all might have seen Mike George recently uh, on a on a tying session. He he tied a beautiful fly, but he emphasized during that that session how little thread he uses. And he was talked a lot about thread control uh, throughout his whole presentation and uh, the the importance of not using too much thread and the problem a lot of people have uh, not only in regular dressing a fly but in spinning hair. They put too many wraps in the same place and then don't understand why it won't tighten. In any case, uh, that's how you secure that particular hair onto that wing. You can build your, your, your eye, uh, your, your head, excuse me, you can build your head uh, to a finished uh, blue charm. Now there's, when you if, you, if you had a clump of hair that was larger than this one, uh, it, you, one technique you might wanna consider is using two pinch wraps to secure that wing material onto the hook shank. And uh, you do everything just the same. You'll, you'll pull the material at, at the tie-in spot to make two pinch wraps instead of one. Now, here's an interesting thing. When you're using multiple pinch wraps, we're gonna do that in the next technique. But if you do multiple pinch wraps, pull straight up for the tightening wraps and go very slow and look over your pinch fingers, your thumb and index finger, look over that and watch those loops slide out of the pinch and onto the top of the hook shank. And you can watch those, those wraps go right on top. And remember, that's the whole idea of tightening thread by pulling straight up. By pulling straight up, that's taking the, the, the apex or the top of that loop and pulling it straight down. Now we're going to look at tying, we're mounting a wing, about a feather wing. Uh, in, in this case, these both slips are, are from a turkey. A slip uh, of material, is, this one's probably 10 or 12 uh, barbs uh, wide off of the same rachis or off of the same feather. Normally on a feather wing fly, uh, the feather is actually either turkey, duck, uh, swan, uh, goose shoulder, Bustard, Argus, it can be any number of, of different types of species, but you just cut off a number of barbs, usually in relation to the gape of the hook. I'm going to show you how to figure that out here in a second. Uh, and then um, you have a slip of material that you're going to form to fit to build a feather wing. Now, if you happen to get into this pathway of salmon flies, uh, understand this. This, this is called a, a, the black dog, and it's one of my favorite patterns of all uh, for a lot of different reasons. But um, you'll notice, for, for those of you that tie these kind of flies, there's a couple of things I'll point out very quickly. You'll notice uh, this is the redensage style of salmon fly in that typically this golden pheasant crest right here would be just slightly behind the bend of the hook and straight up. This tip right here would normally be over here. One thing Michael likes to do is he likes his flies to have a very oblong appearance to them. So he tends to use flatter, longer golden pheasant crest for the tail. And of course that then transfers into or translates into the effect it's gonna have on the topping. And one of the key things in this proportion is the tip of the topping and the tip of the tail and the tip of the slips all meet at the same place. Now, what's interesting on this is here, and if you look closely, there's three red, two bustard, three yellow, three red, two bustard, three yellow, three red, two bustard. So as each of, each of those three barbs were pulled off of a red, a dyed red turkey, for example, then they were attached to two barbs of 
uh, Bustard or Argus or something else. Well, each of these red, red, Bustard, yellow, red, but each of those was an individual slip. Just like this is a slip, instead of it being 10 or 12 barbs wide, it was only three barbs wide. And then you, you, you go through a process of marrying those slips together to form one married wing. And the techniques we're going to look at next pertain to a slip like this or a married wing. So when we're talking about feather wings, uh, we're going to talk about some specific techniques and how to mount those wings to make certain that the, they're mounted properly, but that we don't create indentations and uh, malfunctions up here at the tie-in spot. So this type of slip and this type of married wing would be treated exactly the same when it comes time to tie in. So we're going to take the, the 10 or 12 barb turkey slip and we're going to hold it to the hook shank and we're going to, we're going to hold it up at the tie-in spot and try to determine several things. We want to make certain that the width of the wing, which is like top to bottom, this width here is appropriate and in proportion for this particular pattern. We want to make sure that the length of this wing is the correct length and that's going to be in relation to several things on the hook shank itself, the bend and any other materials that you might have. We want to make certain that the wing has the, the appropriate shape. Now you'll see later here, there, there's some, some things we'll do to, to make certain that the shape of this wing is exactly the way we want it before we begin to mount it. Now, if you'll notice on this particular slip or this wing, the top line is relatively flat and then we get a little bit of slope and, and not a dramatic, some salmon tires call this a hump, but you'll notice how the, the top line has a dramatic bend to it when compared to the top line at the tips. Whatever your pattern calls for is how you're gonna shape this wing. And we try to shape those before we actually begin to secure them to the hook shank. Now, specifically for feather wing flies, uh, you want to hold the material at the tie-in point with your thumb and middle finger. Now, notice that. Typically, we will hold material with our thumb and index finger. But what I'm suggesting for mounting feather wings or handling feather wings, you want to, instead of the index and thumb, we want to use the middle finger and thumb. And the reason for that, if you just look down at you, press your finger, index finger and thumb together, press the middle finger together, and then actually press your ring finger together, you'll notice that each of those fingers has a different amount of flat surface in relation to the thumb. For example, if I press, press the index finger to the thumb pad, there's less common pad space if I'm doing it with index finger and thumb as compared to middle finger and thumb. And actually the best or most pad space is the ring finger and thumb, but a lot of people are not strong enough to hold material with their ring finger and thumb. So a lot of people will just use middle finger and thumb. And you'll see here in a minute why that's very important uh, in, in mounting this particular wing. Okay. Once we've got the, the, the length of the feather just the way we want it, we're going to transfer it to the, to the left hand for right hand tires. And we're going to place the feather on the hook shank and begin to secure the material to the hook shank. But now before we do that, we're going to hold it in place like this. But here's, I want you to think of this concept. I call this the O. This area formed by your fingers and thumb when you're holding a piece of material at the hook shank ready to be tied in. Pay attention to this because if you, if you mount a wing, whether it's a solid slip like this one or a married wing, 
and you do all the correct techniques to tie it in and you take your left hand away and look at it and you realize your wing is bent to the side, it's twisted, it's not going straight back. You can avoid all of that by paying attention to the O that's being created here by your fingers and your thumb when you mount the material in place. So for example, I press the material with my middle finger and my thumb pad. And you'll see here in just a second why that's again important. But while I'm here, as I begin to do pinch wraps with my thread, I can, I can crank down on my pinch wraps and I can still see my wing. And I can make sure that the wing is at the correct angle like maybe say 45 degrees in relation to the hook shank, I can make sure that it hasn't twisted where it's going to be more on one side of the hook shank and another, it's, it's still right on top of the hook shank, or that it's twisted, meaning that the tie-in spot is here, but because I, I moved my hand while I was tying it in, this axis here, the top of the wing actually will point to one side or the other once you take your hand away. So as I'm tying in, I'll pay attention to what's going on inside the O to make sure the angle is exactly the way I want it to be. I'll make two pinch wraps and I'll slowly pull the bobbin holder straight up. Now, this is one of those occasions where uh, pulling straight up and watching your loops is really a handy thing to do. Um, Oh, okay, we'll just use this one. Well, give me an example. Now, one other thing I'll mention uh, for a lot of you folks that do a lot of teaching, for demonstrating techniques and stuff, this is not thread. I actually will demonstrate with a strip of yarn, or I mean, a, a strip of floss. And the reason for that is it's less likely to break, especially if I'm using 14 or 16 knot. And also, uh, if you're going to demonstrate whether it's dressing a fly or specific techniques, always have multiple bobbin holders on your desk so that if your thread breaks, you don't have to wait. The viewers don't have to wait for you to re-thread your thread. You can pick up another bobbin holder and, and go right from there. So. This is actually floss. It, it doesn't break like thread will sometimes. But if I held, if I make a pinch wrap, I'm going to exaggerate this. I want to pinch this just for demonstration purposes. That's my pinch wrap. Now, typically, you wouldn't have that big loop showing like that, but there is a loop in there when you make a pinch wrap. Watch what happens. I'm not going to pull straight up because it'll be in the way. I'm going to pull off to the side. If I pull slowly, look how that loop begins to draw down through my fingers, and I can watch it go right on top of the material and compress the material in exactly the spot that I want it to be. That's what the pinch wrap should look like. So once I've mounted the wing, I do a couple more tightening wraps just to secure it. And when we talked about the importance of using the thumb and the middle finger, this area right in here, the wing wall, is an area where it can, it can fold, it can have little uh, depressions in there, uh, that's what you want to avoid. And having a good firm hold between your thumb and your middle finger help keep this wall in place. Now, I want to point out here too, this is one of the rare occasions uh, when, I'm, when, I'm when I'm securing a feather wing, I typically will leave the butt ends. I won't cut those butt ends off before I mount the, the feather wing. And the reason for that is and not so much on a feather wing like this, but if you're, if you're mounting a married wing, uh, you, you want to make sure that 
the wing is in exactly the right proportion and location. Uh, and but what I mean by that is if I, if I tied this, this wing in, before I let go of it, I've got a good firm hold with my middle finger and thumb. I'm looking into the O to make sure that the wing is in the right angle and it's not twisted. But if I need to adjust it in any way, I use these butt ends right here as a handle. If I cut all this off before I mounted it, I wouldn't have anything to hold on to here. I could put a finger on each side of the tie-in spot, but that can mess up other things. So I try to leave these butt ends as a handle and make certain that when I let go of this wing for the first time after mounting it with my thumb and middle finger, I use the butt ends as a, as a, as a steering wheel and I can turn those wings if I have to to get the vertical nature, the not canted off to one side or the other. And once I know it's in place, I've done two securing wraps, then I'll go in there and I'll cut those butt ends off and, and finish that off. Now, this is one of my favorite techniques of all. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I hope you'll try this one and use it and like it as much as I do. Um, if you are tying in a fly and it calls for a tail a hair tail or a hair wing. Uh, have you ever had the, the occasion where you secure that material and as you tighten it down, the material splays all around the hook shank? Very frustrating. In some patterns like the blue charm we just looked at, we want that wing to sit right on top of the hook shank, not splayed on either side of the hook shank at all, but really a tight bundle right on top of the hook shank. So here's how we do that. With the thread, we'll hold the material a few inches above the hook shank. Now, if this is my tie-in spot right here where the thread is, I'm not holding the material at the tie-in spot. Instead, I'm gonna hold the material a couple inches above the hook shank, and I'm gonna do a pinch wrap. Everybody see that? It's above the hook shank, and I'm doing a pinch wrap, all right? Now, after I do the pinch wrap, I'm gonna to continue to wrap the thread around the bundle, but I'm gonna do a second pinch wrap. Then after I've done the second pinch wrap, I'll continue to wrap the thread around the material, down under the hook shank, and I'll pull straight up. And as I pull straight up, now if I pulled straight up, it, you'd, it'd interfere with your, your vision here. Normally this would be straight up here, but if it, when I pull up on this thread, those two pinch loops are doing two things. It's lowering this bundle of material to the top of the hook shank, and it's compressing the bundle at the same time. So when this bundle comes into contact with the top of the hook shank, the bundle is compressed and it's, I can guide it into the exact tie-in spot simply by pulling a little tension onto the thread and slowly allowing the, the wing and material to lower to the to a hook. Now, you, you, to emphasize here once again, once this material gets down to this point, before I get down to the hook shank, I will be looking in my O over here to make sure that this wing is still, move, is still at the same angle I want it to be. And I can, I, I, it's important for my, these, my thumb and finger to hold that at that precise angle because as my thread tightens that bundle, that's the angle I want it to maintain. Now, here's a little secret. What do you see interesting about this? Well, I continued to pull up on my thread. Both of those loops, thread loops that were in my pin trap, slid through my fingers. They grasped the material, tightened the bundle, and they're resting right on top of the hook shank. I should add one other thing here. You want to make sure 
that when you're securing this kind of material, like on a hair wing, a, a, a caddis fly, that type of thing, have a thread base. Have a thread base. Uh, and some people will actually put a very small drop of glue right at the tie-in spot. So as that, that hair is compressed, it's compressed against the glue on top of the hook shank. But look at this right here. See that X? Now, when you try this technique, all I want you to do is pull on your thread and watch those loops slide through your pinch wrap, encumber the, the material, tighten the bundle, and lower it to the top of the hook shank. And what, what you're looking for is for you, these two thread loops to lower onto the material and end up being an edge to edge wrap. You can watch, it's really cool. You can watch the first loop go down. You can watch the second loop come out of the pinch and go right next to the preceding loop. It's really cool to see. But, and as good as that is, as good as that is, as you're tightening that material and lowering the bundle and tightening the material onto the hook shank by simply moving your hand two different directions as you're lowering it, those, those loops, pinch loops, will slide out of your pinch and form an X. Now, I think that's really cool. That's really cool. Don't, if you don't have the X right now, that's okay because your material will hold in place very, very well simply by those two loop, thread loops, pinch loops, lowering onto the material and tightening. That's, that's what you're shooting for right there. But this, this I use this for, for tails, but I use it almost exclusively. There, there's a, a pattern out there called a picket pen. And I, I could bore you with the history of the picket pen, but it's a very, very effective uh, hair wing pattern. Uh, really great history to it. But in any case, it's got a, a clump of hair for the tail and a clump of hair for the wing. Uh, and that's just one example, but any kind of hair wing fly, I use this technique of the thread loops to secure the, hold it above a couple inches above the hook shank, two thread loops. And as you pull up on the thread, that will compress the bundle and it'll lower it right to the top of the hook shank. And that's what it would look like. Now notice how, th how this looks right here. Those thread wraps are vertical edge to edge, and it's the base, it's the base for this wing. This thread wrap here maintains this angle. And you can do all of that simply by doing the thread loop around a bundle. Now, I apologize for the darkness of this, but Charlie Craven uh, allowed me to use this uh, for the presentation. And I, I want to remember we're talking about thread here, so I'm not emphasizing a lot on material, but this is, this is a good example of one of the many methods you can use to post a wing. Uh, this is a good one to do uh, because from this type of technique, you can create a posted wing with your thread, or you can create a spinner wing with your thread. There's other ways to create the post uh, using just a single piece of material and so forth. But this, this, knowing this technique gives you some real versatility, whether you're tying a spinner or a true post. Now, once you tie this, the, the material in, we, we just secured it on top of the hook shank at the tie-in spot right there. After we've done that, we're gonna hold each end of the material and turn it so that it's both, both pieces of material are gonna come out perpendicular to the hook shank. This is the most crucial step in tying a post wing right here. A lot of people put so much emphasis on what the, how do you maneuver your thread around the post. This is the key to a, a, a posted wing right here. 
once you've straightened out the material or made it perpendicular to the hook shank coming out both ways, with your thread in front of the material, I'm going to do two thread wraps edge to edge on this wing. Go underneath, come over the top, do two thread wraps on this wing. I'm going to tighten each one of those. Then after doing two wraps, then I'm going to do two figure eights. Emphasis on edge to edge. This is a mistake I see a lot of people make when they're posting a wing. They think the more thread they tie around here, this X area in here, that it's going to be, it's going to hold it better. You're creating bulk and it actually loosens the material once you're trying to build the post because the thread does not compress well against a clump of thread. So pay particular attention to this step right here. Once you have your wings going out both, both directions, perpendicular, coming from the front, from the eye toward the bend, two wraps, one go underneath, second one edge to edge, tighten both of them. Come underneath, over the, the underneath, over the top of this side, edge to edge twice, tighten both of those. Then do two figure eights edge to edge. That wing is secure. Now, if you're tying a spinner, you've got your wing in place. But if you're going to tie a post, then you take the next step. Once you've taken that crucial step of the tie in, then you'll hold, lift both pieces of the material straight up. With your thread, you'll very slowly start to do edge to edge wraps going up the hook shank, edge to edge. Being a posted wing, I'm going to have two hackle. Now here's what he, technically, here's what the, the hackle is tied in. The hackle, it, you'll notice the rachis is bare. Strip off the bottom part of the feathers, tie it in up here behind the eye. Don't allow the material, the, the hackle, to go to on each side of the post. Take them both on the same side. You don't want to separate them. Tie them in here, begin edge to edge wraps going back to the post. Go underneath and continue the edge to edge wraps for about two or three wraps on the other side of the post. Emphasis again on the bare rachis right here. Now that wing is tied in place. Then you're going to lift that wing up and hold it next to the wing. So here is the initial wing. And you can't see it from this angle, but the, the hackle is on this side. The, the bottom side of the hackle is, a, a, is, is, is resting against this white material. It's bottom side toward the material, top side of the, of the hackle, facing outward. Now, this, this next step is really cool. You can take a couple more thread wraps to secure the post. But here's, here's what Charlie does. Once he's got a couple thread wraps, he inverts his bobbin holder. His bobbin holder is upside down. He doesn't even have to hold on to the wing. But his bobbin holder is upside down, and he'll continue to spiral those wraps around the post securely, but not pulling too tight. We all know what happens if you pull too tight. And he'll continue to wrap up the post until he gets to this point right here, where he can see a little bit of the bare hackle, the bare rachis on the hackle. Once he gets to this point, then he wraps the, the thread back down the post. Before he starts down again, you'll notice when you pull the separate the two wings, 
you can still see the bare rachis. This is important to know how far up do you wrap thread. You want to leave a bare space right here. Once you get up to this point, you've got this kind of relationship with a bare space, then wrap your thread back down. Now, remembering that this is a thread control session, we're not going to talk more about how you finish dressing the fly. But as far as the thread is concerned, he inverted his thread. He formed the base. First, remember, he tied the wing in very securely. Hold the, lifted the material up, began to tie the base in. And once he got the base started, he inverted his thread, continued to make circular wraps around the base, the post. And he, he, he holds on to the wing for a while and tightens that the best he can, but not pulling too hard because those wraps will come right off the wing. And he'll keep wrapping up until he gets to this spot right here. Then he wraps back down. Now, Charlie doesn't do this, but one thing you might consider is sometimes when folks get to this spot right here, before you begin your thread wraps, you can take a very small bodkin and actually put a few drops of UV around the post. Spread it a little bit evenly, holding the, the wing upright, and then zap it with your light. Then begin to do your thread wraps up the post. OK. Another question I hear often from people, how do you tie in deer hair? Because if I'm tying the elk hair caddis kind of fly, I tie in the deer hair and, and I get it tied in. It looks just fine. But when I go to fish it, it slides around on me. And I may cast it a few times and pull it in and look at it. And the actual uh, wing is on the side of the hook shank. What happened? Well, we're going to do this. We're going to tie in the wing, just a clump of, of deer or elk hair, at a determined tie-in spot. I will have a thread base under here. Once again, on hair wings, it's really good to have a thread base under the tie-in spot. So I put a thread base, I'll do the tie-in process, to tie this clump in with these butt ends sticking out. Then I'm gonna take a whip finish tool and I'm actually gonna slide two or three whip finishes under the butt, between the hook shank and the butt. Now, when you do this, this, this is typically the vertical thread, but this it's important right here. This part of the thread needs to go on the hook shank and slide it as far up to the butt of the, of the, the feather, the hair butts as you can get it. Snug this in there really tight underneath the butts. Do two or three whip finishes. Then, I'm going to take my thread and I'm going to run my thread through the bottom third of that clump of deer hair butts. Then I'm going to run the next wrap about the middle of that clump of deer hair butts. Then the last wrap, or excuse me, next to last wrap is in the top third of those butts. And as you pull each of those threads through there, secure them really tightly, straight up, pull straight up. And then the last one is, once again, on the tie-in spot. Now, here's a little, little thing you might try. Try this technique. And I promise you, your, your elk hair wings won't turn when you're fishing, even after they've been, been, been taken. But if you can get to this step right here, where you're going to begin to tie your thread through the bottom third, then the middle, then the top third. Do it as a whip finish. So in other words, what I, what I typically do is I'll put a couple whip finishes underneath the butts, snugged up against the hook shank. And then I, I, I continue holding my whip finish tool or my, my fingers and using a whip finish tool, I'll do the bottom third. Then I'll do a middle using whip finish tool and the top third using whip finish tool. 
Then I'll do one more whip finish right there. That wing will not move while you're fishing it. Okay, now this, this one, Sandy, Patty, tell me if we need this. I'd like to go for one more technique if we, if we can. Okay, and we did have um, one question okay. uh, back when you were uh, tying the wing on um, and doing the, the um, pinch loop. Yes. We had a question, uh, do you do the pinch loop around the hook shank or just the hair? Great question. Let me see if I can. I should I stop the time, that. but I didn't see the question come in right away. Okay, let's see if I can. If I'm going to tie this clump of deer hair onto this hook shank, I'm going to hold the tips and I like to, uh, I don't know what, some people like to use serrated edge scissors for hair. Uh, these are Fiskars scissors. I get them at uh, Joann's or Michael's craft stores, those kind of places. They're, they're not serrated, but they are outstanding for cutting any kind of hair. So I'll trim those butts off. Now I'm ready to secure this clump to the hook shank. Give yourself plenty of thread. I'm gonna do a pinch wrap, go around the material. I'm gonna do a secure it. I'm gonna do a second pinch wrap. A second pinch wrap. And after the second pinch wrap, I'm gonna lay the thread right at the tie-in spot. And this is where I begin to pull straight up. And as I pull straight up, I'm lowering the material to the top of the hook shank. You'll see that, and I'm tightening it, you'll see the butts splay out. And I'll do a couple securing wraps right there. The wings in place. So on the, on the loop, on the pinch loops, you want those two pinch loops to be around the material before you go to the hook shank. So two pinch loops around the material and the third wrap goes around the bottom of the hook shank and pull straight up. And pulling straight up does two things. It lowers the clump to the top of the hook shank and it compresses the bundle at the same time. And just as you saw there, I can, I can pull down pretty tight or, or tighten that really tight and notice how I can see, I can see how the the butt ends are going to splay. I know that hair is being tightened. Does that answer the question? She just wrote thank you, so um, it looks mm -hmm. like it did. Thanks, for, thanks for taking the time to show that, Dutch. Uh, it's a great question, and and I get with a lot of these techniques. If if you've not done them before, they might feel a little bit awkward at first, but practice the pinch loop to secure material because this one will not only help you mount the material better on the, on the hook shank, but it really cleans up the look of your fly. When that wing is nice and tight, resting right on top of the hook shank, that is very appealing to the eye instead of it being splayed all around the top of it. Uh, so practice with that and, until you feel very comfortable. Sandy, do we have time for one or two more? Uh, I put you on for an hour and a half, so um, if oh. people need to go, okay. um, we record these. Uh, they take a little bit to get in the library, but okay. they will be there, and you'll be up on Facebook for a week. Okay. So if you just want to stay, feel free to stay. If you want to come back and watch it later, it is recorded. So go, so go ahead, Dutch. Okay, thank you, Sandy. What, what I'd like to do here is uh, walk through the a method using thread control to fork two tails or fork three tails. Um, instead of a lot of people will go to the tie-in spot back at the start of the bend and make a dubbing ball and then tie in their tail material, whether it's uh, pheasant, turkey, 
micro five bets. Uh, yet another one you might consider if you've never tried it is paintbrush. Uh, I'm not trying to sound like fishy Fulham, but uh, that's one uh, domestic material I'll use uh, because paintbrush is pretty tough. And a tail, like on an RS2 or a mayfly kind of pattern, can take a beating. And uh, you can get them in different uh, black or kind of a clear color. But in any case, I use uh, paintbrush sometimes for tails. But what a lot of people will do is they'll go to the start of the bend and they'll tie in a, a ball, a thread ball. They'll just find the tie in spot and they'll just continue to make thread wraps over top of the preceding ra thread wraps until they have a little ball sticking up. Then they'll tie in the material toward the eye so that that material, as you tighten it down, that little ball, you just tie a thread ball, splits the material. It also creates bulk. And if you want to eliminate that, then here is a good technique to tie in two or three pieces of tail without using any bumps or any bulk at all. Now, just, just for reference sake, uh, I did a reverse jam hitch. Remember that from last time? Instead of regular jam hitch, I did a reverse jam hitch right here. Wrap my thread toward the eye because I wanted a thread base and I knew that I was going to tie in the two pieces of tail material right where the thread is hanging, right there. Also notice the reverse or the start of this thread goes just inside the hook point. Use the anatomy of your hook to help guide your proportions. So I don't want to go any further toward the bend than where I am right there. So I began this, this thread base just inside or just to the gape of the hook point, wrapped it forward. Now I've got two pieces of tail material. I'm going to tie them in right where the thread is hanging. So I tied them in right there. I started doing edge to edge wraps going toward the bend. I just continued on. But now look what happened. Look where I stopped wrapping thread. The body begins up here. So I use thread wraps from where the body began. Come on, right there. I use thread wraps around bare hook shank to the stopping spot, which is right above the hook barb. Once again, using hook anatomy to help with my proportions. If you're going to be involved in the FFI uh, fly tying award program, uh, really using your, your hook anatomy and so forth helps with proportions because proportions are very, very crucial uh, to that whole process. So now what happened? Let's just think about this now. If, I, if the body, if the thread base stops here where the cursor is located, when I continued wrapping the tail material to here, each one of those pieces of tail material were separated here by the bare hook. I held the material firmly and I allowed each piece of material to slide just right off the top onto the side of the hook shank as I wrapped thread from here to here. So those two pieces of thread or two pieces of tail material were on top side by side up here. And as I got back to the end of the material of the thread base, I allow the two pieces of material to go on each side of the hook shank and continue to wrap, securing them in place, stopping right at the hook barb. 
Dutch, yeah. can you add a third one with that? Because you know you have three tails. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I, or do you go ahead and put the uh, thread a thread piece in for the third one? Patty, that is a great question. It's almost like we rehearsed this. That's the next thing we're going to do. Oh, I'm sorry. I, no, I no, too it's, soon. It, you, you, this that's a great question because we get we get to two in place and then we go to we get real fancy and we go to three. Okay. We're not done yet. Now we know that there's some separation because each of these pieces of material is on each side of the hook shank. But here's the cool thing about this. Do a half hitch right here. Throw a half hitch in right there. So when you take the tension off of the thread and you go in any direction, that half hitch is going to hold right there. The half hitch will hold right here. So let's suppose we just did a half hitch. Now, what you see right here, this long piece right here is the stem of my bobbin holder. The thread has no tension on it. See how the thread is coming off of the half hitch right here. There's no tension on the thread as it comes all the way around here. And what I'm going to do now is allow this big soft loop of thread to slide onto the hook shank. And I'm very gently, very gently, I'm going to lift up my bobbin holder and allow the thread to slide up the hook shank until it goes edge to edge with the lat where the, the, the half hitch is located. And here's what happens. As the thread slides up the hook, We've already got that secure there with the half hitch. As the sli thread slides up the hook, as it gets right underneath the two pieces of material, it firms them in that position being separated. So I'm going to continue my thread very gently. I don't want to go hard or fast there because that could cause that separation to occur too much. But I'm going to get right to that point. Then I'm going to do one more tightening wrap. Now what some people will do right here is after they do one more tightening wrap before they go on to the next element, they'll put a small, emphasize small drop of UV resin right here. Just a very small drop. And by the way, uh, I don't have one here, but think of your, your bottles of glue uh, whether it be Loctite, uh, Sally Hansen's, um, Crazy Glue. Uh, I won't get into it right now, but I actually use a product called Healthy Hoof. Uh, we've been in the ranching business a long time, and we used to get buckets of this stuff called Healthy Hoof. Hoof. We take a paintbrush, paint it on the hoof walls of our horses. And I realized one day, when you consider the stuff they stand in, that Healthy Hoof helps those walls stay pretty tough. So I started using Healthy Hoof instead of Sally Hansen's or Loctite or any of that kind of stuff. And it's incredible how good it is. But in any case, take the applicator that has a little brush, regardless of the product, take the applicator and a napkin or something and wipe off whatever the product is. Then take your scissors and cut out about half of those bristles on your applicator. You might even want to do two thirds of the bristles, cut them off. And the reason for that is from that point on, when you dip that applicator into the glue and you come up to put it onto your, onto your fly that you're dressing, the drop of glue will be very, very small. But if you use the bristle in total as it is when you buy it, that's a pretty big drop. And sometimes that drop creates a problem for you. So if you looked at all the bristles and all the applicators and any glue bottles I have, you'd say, well, you, you, got, the, you got the cheap version because you didn't get enough bristles. Well, I cut them off. I cut the bristles off. The, the, okay, so that's, that's forking two tails. Do a securing wrap right there. You can go on to the next element.
Now, like Patty said, sometimes we have a fly that has three tails. So how do we how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to start out the same way. It's hard to tell, but there's three pieces of tail material tied in right here. We're going to tie it into the same kind of spot, almost like the 50% spot. You'll notice once again, the thread base goes just beyond the hook point. So I'm gonna tie all three of them in right here. Now, for three, I'm gonna pay real close attention on every thread wrap from the tie-in all the way till I'm finished tying in to make sure that those three pieces of material stay side by side. I don't want them overlapping. I don't want them twisting. So I'm going to be very careful from the time I tie them in right here. And if, and if you just put three of any kind of material, of any kind of tail material there, and you do a securing wrap, a tightening wrap right there, they will separate. They will, they will not be clumped up. And then keep make sure they stay un, unclumped. You don't want them overlapping right on top of the hook shank from the tie-in spot going all the way back, just like we did on two tails. So now we get back to this spot. We're gonna do something different. I used red here just for point of emphasis, but I just took a piece of thread, a piece of thread, and I formed a loop around the hook bend. See if I can emphasize that. I'm just going to take a piece of thread. Make sure it's long enough. Give yourself a chance. And I'm just going to make a loop. with this piece of thread. I'm going to allow the loop now to go on to the bend of the hook. We do that again. Piece of thread, make it into a loop. I'm going to take that big loop on the bottom of the thread and ride it down the hook shank to the bend. I'm going to hold it tight right there. What you see on the camera is exactly this same thing right here. Now, I should have mentioned, think again now on that two tail strand. Once we tied that butt ends, that material in, we didn't touch the material. We didn't touch the tail material at all after that. And it's the same thing here. So we're going to tie those three in. We're going to do carefully wrap all the way back to this point here. I'm going to put a finger or a thumb right on top of those three. And by doing that, light pressure right on top, right here, will cause those three pieces of material to separate. One will stay on the top, one goes on each side of the hook shank. So as I have light pressure here, I did my, my thread loop here around the bend. And as I put light pressure here, I see these three pieces of material separate. Now, really cool, I'm going to lift that loop up so that the loop goes on each side of the middle piece of tail and on the inside of each adjacent piece of tail. Now you all have that concept right there. Very slowly, I'm going to lift that thread loop up, the red thread loop. And you can use red if you want to, but I only use red for teaching purpose. So I'm going to use this loop by pressing lightly here with my finger. These P3 pieces of material will spread apart. And then I'm going to lift, slowly lift this thread loop, this extra piece of thread loop, so that the loop goes on each side of the middle piece of tail. 
I'm going to continue to gently lift that up and go very slowly so that this thread loop will slide from down here where we started. It slides up. All the while, that loop has separated. You can see how the three pieces are separated. And that middle piece is right in the middle of that loop. I'm going to continue to very slowly and very carefully continue to move that loop forward. Now look at that tail. Thread did that. How cool is that? Now here's a caution. You don't want to, once you get to this point right here, you don't want to pull too hard because you can contort the configuration of these three pieces of tail material. So this sliding of the loop up to here is very slow and very gradual. And once you get to this point right here, you've left your thread in just the right spot. You can do securing wrap of those loops, of that loop. And once you've secured the loop, then you can cut it off. Again, what some people will do is take that, that applicator with half the bristles cut off and take a very small drop of UV resin and drop it right there, right where those three pieces come together, right on top of the hook shank, zap it with your torch, and those three tails will not move. I even do this, you can think of a lot of mayfly patterns, stonefly patterns that have, have pretty significant tails. Matter of fact, one of my pet peeves is before you tie your next mayfly pattern, please go to Google or some search engine and type in mayfly. Then once that comes up, click on the images. Take a good look at the tail of those mayflies. If you can find a picture of a mayfly where the tail is as long as the hook shank, I'll send you $10. Because I know you're not going to do it. The length of the tail on a mayfly is at least one and a half lengths the body of the hook shank. At least. If you get into the hexagenia and some of the bigger mayflies, it's two lengths or more. So what happens to fly tires? Well, we see these videos of Bubba in the garage where he says, well, the tail is the length of the hook shank. Well, no, it's not. No, it's not. If you're going to tie professional looking, properly proportioned flies that you're, you're proud you dressed it, then understand what the natural looks like. Now, I won't get into weighted flies because that, that's just overbearing, but pay particular attention to the length of those mayfly tails and don't shortchange the length of a mayfly tail. But even on something small like an RS2, I, those tails on my RS2s are at least one and a half times the, sh the length of the, of, the sh of the shank. Okay. We did uh -huh. have a question, Dutch. Okay. Um, and and uh, one of our audience members a answered it, but you can, you can jump in. Uh, Sherry asked, do you cut the excess of the applicator lengthwise or widthwise? And the answer was lengthwise or both sides to a point. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, you can. You can, you can cut it both ways. Uh, most effective is to cut widthwise, I guess. So let's, let's, let's put numbers on it. Let's suppose your applicator had 30 bristles. I would cut it right at where the, app, where the bristles begin. So now it's got 15 bristles, only 15. And actually that would be a lot for my applicators. I like very few bristles on my applicators. The, the point about the vertical cut, that's handy as well. And that will result in a very, very fine, a very small bead of whatever the material is. You can do it either way. But if, if the concept is to better control the size or the amount of glue 
that's being used so that you don't use an amount that is uh, detracts from or destroys your fly, then cutting off half, at least half the bristles, leaving them still the same length will, will accomplish that as far as getting a smaller bead of blue to apply. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Now we're, we're closing in on that hour and a half. So let, let's do this. Um, this folding feathers is a, is a really interesting thing and it's gonna change how you uh, wrap hackle, uh, whether body hackle, but in particular collars, uh, it, it'll change how you do that. Uh, so what I'd like to do, Sandy, Patty, if it's okay, uh, for next session, we'll plan to pick it up right here. But I'd like to ask also in the meantime, uh, I, th I think we have four after this particular uh, technique, four others. Then we have some more uh, fundamental skills we can, we can pick up on too. But what I'd really like to do is if between now and next week, if anybody has any questions or comments or hey, could you, could you demonstrate this or that, or spend a little more time talking about this or that? Or would you explain again why you do this or that? Uh, I'd like some feedback from the group if there's something in particular uh, you would like to discuss. And, and, and I'll prepare for that for next time. and We'll go from there. Are and there any questions before we finish up today? You have um, uh, one question uh, from James. Do you have a preferred UV glue? Boy, that, that's, that's a great question. And uh, yes, I do. Um, this is going to sound kind of crazy, but um, to get to the favorite UV, uh, when we first got started using UV resin, one of the real issues was how tacky it was. You could put a drop or apply it somewhere, zap it with your torch and, and leave it, you know, torch it long enough or even take it out in the sunlight and it would still feel tacky. And then what some people said was after you do that, then put just a little coat of uh, head cement on there and that will eliminate the tackiness and so forth. Uh, but as the materials have come out now, I've kind of migrated to solar res. Uh, and the reason for that is it's, uh, it came to fly tying and fly fishing from the surfboard industry. And it's actually something that dentists use. Now this is where the crazy thing comes in. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't admit this uh, many places, uh, but I can tell you that I've actually tasted them. Uh, I studied a lot about fish behavior and fish habitat and stuff like that. And uh, fish, I won't get into it, fish have these chemical receptors all over their bodies. Carp have more than anybody else, but they have these things and they, and they can detect chemicals. And that's one of the things that keeps fish out of toxic water. They can, they don't taste necessarily, they can, they de if something goes in their mouth, they spit it out, it's texture. If you watch underground video of a fish taking them something, if they, they, they could open and close their mouths five or six times a second, that's pretty fast. So if they take something and it's not the texture that a natural insect would be, it comes out right, right away. Well, they do the same thing with the fly. And if they have those chemical receptors that might be sensitive to some of these other products that were out on the market early on, they were really strong. Uh, we could always tell in our fly tying group when somebody was doing some UV resin because it just stunk up the place and it was just uh, strong. But this solar res is not as bad and dentists use it in their dental practice. And so I, I've actually tasted it. I know it's crazy, but I've actually tasted it. It doesn't have the same taste <laughs> I could tell you it tastes like chicken, but it, it doesn't have the same taste that other UV resins will have, but I like it. You can get it in, one thing I like about it is you can get it in various viscosities. So depending on the type of pattern you're dressing, you can 
uh, get different viscosities of resin to uh, uh, that are compatible. Um, but I like the way it, it, it surfboarders started using it. I, I heard the story that some surfboard guy was in his dentist dentist office and he was complaining about a crack in his surfboard and his dentist here take some of this and fix it. And so the guy did. He put this solar as in the crack on his, on his fiberglass board and boom, it was just like new. But then that migrated into fly fishing. I carry, I carry solar res in my, my pack when I'm fishing in case I get a leak in the waders. Uh, I've used Aquiel and all this other stuff, but think about this. I can, I can apply a little bit of solar res to a potential hole or leak in my waders and just put my leg out there and let the sun cure it and I'm, I'm ready to go. So solar res is the one I use not only for fly fishing, but I, that's the one I prefer for uh, fly tying as well. And I use it, I find more uses for it. And as a matter of fact, I was talking to Jerry Coviello recently about doing a, a video on how to use UV resin. Uh, there's so many applications for it now that we're finding new uses for it all the time. A lot of people don't use any kind of lacquer or varnish to finish the heads on their flies, even salmon flies because uh, a lot of people are using more UV resin to finish a fly. The other nice thing about that is you can put a drop of UV resin on the head of a fly. And please keep the heads of your flies small. Small, keep a small head on you. If you're tying a salmon fly, the width and size of your head should be no bigger than the size of the hurl butt back at the tail. That's pretty small. So keep the head small, but you can take solar res and put a drop of it on, on a head of a fly, take a fine bodkin and move that around, spread it out, and you can actually shape the taper on the head without doing a whole lot of extra thread wraps. So pretty handy. Hey Dutch, I've got a question for you. I, um, I, can, I can do a whip finish either by hand or by the tool and maybe this is for you and, and uh, Al and Gretchen, but I was watching a YouTube video the other day and the gentleman said, when you do a hand whip finish, you are creating bulk in the thread because you are twisting the thread every time you do the, the turn over the hook eye versus using the tool. And I've never heard that, never thought about that. I just wondered if that's true or not true. If you're trying to keep, let's say a head relatively small on a, you know, a size 18, 20 mayfly or whatever. Well, my, my I'd like to hear uh, Gretchen and Al answer too, but my answer would be uh, yes and no. <laughs> and I'm well, not sure. <laughs> but here, here's what I mean by that, Terry. Um, you can do a hand whip finish two different ways where the maneuver of the thread is on the on your side of the hook shank or on the far side of the hook shank. You're going to roll the loop underneath on either one and you can place that precisely where you want it to be. And as you do, you, you're torquing the thread as you maneuver the thread with your fingers, but you're actually creating an additional half hitch. Now that's not bulk. If you, I would say yes to his statement in that if you do whip finishes, piling them on top of the previous whip finish, you're creating a lot of bulk and it's not holding the material any better. Point being, remember when you use your whip finish tool or your fingers, remember to be sure that your thread is flattened before you do the, the technique. Do the whip finish, whether with the tool or your fingers, and every wrap of the vertical section of the, of the whip finish is an edge-to-edge -edge wrap going from the end of the material, where you stopped the material, at the bend end of the head, let's say. Edge, you can do four whip finishes edge-to-edge -to -edge toward the eye and call it good. None of those went over top of the previous whip finish. Each one of those is a securing wrap. But if you're a kind of person that's going to take a tool or your fingers and just keep doing whip finishes in the same spot, you're going to create a lot of bulk. So that's why I say uh, yes and no. 
Well, he wasn't talking bulk. He was talking more of, uh, I guess, maybe, you know, if you're if you're if you're not flattening the thread, but you're you're going the opposite version, right. depending on which way you're, whether you're left-handed or right-handed. Mm -hmm. He was talking about actually creating more of a uh, a roundness to the thread versus a flattening of the thread. I guess that's what he was referring to. Well, you will do that, Terry. But the the problem that that creates is that you're actually going to build a torque loop into the whip finish. And if you ever if you ever do a whip finish and you didn't flatten your thread before you did the whip finish, but you noticed as you started to do the whip finish, the loop jumped toward the eye. Mm -hmm. That's full of clockwise twist. So he could he could solve a problem for himself if he would flatten his thread before he did the whip finish, lay each whip finish wrap, vertical wrap, adjacent to the preceding one, and you don't create any additional torque. Gary, gotcha. Gretchen, uh, would you agree with that or what would your perspective be? Well, first off, I agree with everything that you said. I would add one other way of doing a whip finish and I'm gonna call it the Bob Jacklin method just because I need to identify how he does it and, and it's how I learned way back when. And that is that you lay the bobbin on top of the vise and then you form the loop and hand over hand it and you can lay it as flat as you want it to be. So there are no twists at all. Yeah. Dancing the thing as, as you wish. And the other thing, or I think it was Terry that asked the question, if I have a really small fly and I want a really small head, I take a little bit of that solar edge, just like, like uh, Dutch was talking about, and I don't whip finish. I just put um, about a half an inch of the thread covered in that, wrap it on the hook, and uh, hit it with the light, cut it off, and, uh, and go fishing. Also, uh, you might have covered this in y'all's book, but another good thing you can do with that is to actually use glue or resin and apply it directly to the thread, uh, little beads, and wipe it onto the thread, then wrap the thread. And this is good where you don't have a lot of room, like a, a small, an RS2 again, a small head. You can put the, the, the product, you can put the UV resin or glue right onto the thread and then wrap that just like you would do regular adjacent wraps. Let it dry and that'll hold. Now, one I, other thing, yes, sir. I must have just did a bad job of explaining because that's what I was trying to explain. You did a better job of explaining oh, than I did. Okay. Well, let me show you. There's there's one other whip finish that I did not mention last time. I want to show you very quickly. It's called the Borger hitch. It's a Gary Borger technique. And uh, he does it a lot where there's not a lot of room. But when he's ready to do a whip finish, he forms a loop. And I'll see the loop. He'll do one wrap. Then he allows the loop to go around the hook, pulls it tight. And that's an incredibly tight double hitch whip finish. But it's a good technique and it's one you need to practice to get accustomed because once you make the loop and you wrap the loop around the head of the, of the hook, you wanna make sure that when you make your loop don't do more than one wrap turn. Because if you do more than one wrap turn, then you take the loop around the eye and pull on it, it's gonna to be too tight. And you probably will break your thread, possibly break your thread. But it's a, it's a good technique to, to use uh, as an alternative to a whip finish. We did have a um, request for next week. Um, uh, Sherry says she would love to see how to tie an extended body on a mayfly, especially <laughs> using vinyl glove material. <laughs> you, you know, one of the challenges, Sandy, in, in this particular session is to be able to think about how to discuss all the different types of thread control and keep it about thread control because it is so easy to get off and start talking about dressing techniques and methods to, to do different things. But there is actual thread considerations in an extended body. And um, I'll throw that in next week. 
Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any requests? I, I put everybody on mute. Um, so take yourself off of mute if you have a question for Dutch. I don't have a question, but this is just awesome stuff, Dutch. Thank you, Patty. I mean, you are, and, and I, I saw a lot of uh, uh, chat about it. What a great teacher you are, et cetera. So uh, I think everybody give you a thumbs up on that. Well, thank you. It means a lot to me. It's important to me. One day I hope to get as good as, as Gretchen and Al. That's a, that's a, a nice compliment. However, it's a little bit of song and dance there. But I have one question for you, Dutch. Yes, sir. I haven't seen all of your presentation, but what I've seen up to this point is a book. <laughs> and uh, by the time you get through all this, and, now, and don't go laughing about this, oh. you've, got, you've got the photographs and the photo captions already in your PowerPoint presentation. And your unique way of explaining things could easily be changed into the written word. So I, I think I'm telling you, you need to do it. Well, uh, that, that really touches me that you would say that. I, it, it has crossed my mind, but uh, I, I appreciate very much that you would say that. That I, have, I teach two classes at a local college here that are strictly fly fishing, and uh, one of them is for experienced fly fishers, and the slide deck for that one's up about 450 slides. And uh, those students have said the same thing. They said, Dutch, we thought you should write a book about the content of this class, but it should be more like a volume encyclopedia thing because there's so much. I have people that have taken that class six and seven semesters in a row. There's just so much material, but, uh, and, and I'll, I'll throw this in and then stop, but uh, it's kind of been a, a habit my teaching method for as long as I can remember. When I'm done here tonight, I'll probably look at the, the live video and critique it. And I'll change the content wherever it might be necessary in the slide deck. And I do that after every one of my classes. So my students kid me all the time that they like to take the class second, third, fourth, fifth time because they know it's going to change that I continue to update and update. And so your feedback your questions, your comments really help a lot to fine tune the information that we try to discuss here. So thank you on, and Al, thank you so much for that. And if, um, if anybody uh, is new to the group tonight, uh, we do send out emails with the link um, for our, our fly tying groups. Every Tuesday night, we have a calendar out through March uh, of ties flies we're going to tie. Um, good instructors coming up, so send a request to um, womenconnect at flyfishers.org, and uh, we will um, um, we'll put you on our mailing list, and you'll get the link every week for our fly tying. So thank you for those that are new tonight. I, I, I think uh, Terry found you on your Facebook page, Dutch, so um, um, he's, he's new to the group tonight. We welcome you, and uh, Look forward to next week. Wow. I think James was new too. So uh, is new too. Good. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. Well, I will as well. It's a pleasure to be with y'all. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful. I really appreciate the tips. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'll try to think of something to say next time. <laughs> oh, you will. Uh, and in the chat, if you uh, need to, uh, make a connection with Women Connect. Corey put the information up there on uh, where you need to uh, send your request. Thank you, Patty. Look yeah, in Dutch, chat, yeah. Yeah, Dutch, in chat um, throughout, I didn't want to in, uh, interrupt you, but uh, you got a lot of compliments, especially on um, how clear and concise uh, your your uh, explanations were. I, I outstanding program. Thank you, Dutch. I love Dutch's teaching. Um, <laughs> Dutch is such a great teacher. Absolutely awesome explanation. So clear and concise. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So, oh, um, you. yeah, you're pretty much a superstar tonight. Well, I'm not very smart, so I have to explain <laughs> things to well I can understand them. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure being with y'all. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right.
Good Darwin, night, everyone. You. And um, if you uh, look on uh, Women Connect for next week and get a hold of Patty and I, and we'll send you the links. Thanks so much again, Dutch. My pleasure, Sandy. Healthy Thank and you. safe, everyone. Right. Thank Come you. Uh, Thanks, Dutch. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Patty, Corey, and Sandy for organizing. Our Thank pleasure. You. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right. Thanks, everybody. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. <laughs>